Imagine till this 21st century, tubes such as thermionic tubes are still used in some applications such as magnetron used in microwaves oven. This is vacuum tube, and this part 2 of this series of road to transistor, we explore vacuum tube. Once upon a time, in the late 19th century, amidst a world of burgeoning scientific exploration, there emerged a spark of innovation that would shape the course of technology for generations to come. It all began with the humble yet revolutionary discovery by Thomas Edison in 1883, the Edison Effect. In the glow of Edison's laboratory, electrons were observed dancing within a vacuum, liberated from a heated filament. This phenomenon, later termed the Edison effect, laid the groundwork for what would become the mesmerizing world of vacuum tubes. With each passing year, scientists and inventors delved deeper into the mysteries of these electron dances. Among them was John Ambrose Fleming, whose ingenuity in 1904 birthed the Fleming valve, the precursor to the modern vacuum tube. But it was the audacious Lee de Forest who dared to dream beyond the confines of existing knowledge. In 1906, he introduced the world to the Audion, a triode vacuum tube that could amplify signals, setting the stage for a technological revolution. Across continents, the echoes of vacuum tubes reverberated through the airwaves, ushering in an era of unprecedented communication and connectivity. From radio broadcasts captivating the masses to clandestine military communications shaping the fate of nations, the vacuum tube stood as a silent sentinel, channeling the whispers of the world. In the midst of global turmoil, vacuum tubes found new purpose in the realm of computation. With the birth of ENIAC, the world's first electronic computer, vacuum tubes paved the way for unprecedented feats of calculation and analysis. Yet, with progress comes change, and the march of technology spares no relic of the past. As the years unfurled, the transistor emerged, a diminutive marvel that would herald the twilight of the vacuum tube era. With the rise of transistors and integrated circuits, the once dominant vacuum tube yielded its throne, retreating into the annals of history. Yet, its legacy endured a testament to the indomitable spirit of human ingenuity and the relentless pursuit of progress. Today, the whispers of vacuum tubes still echo in the hearts of enthusiasts and aficionados, their warm glow and harmonious hum a nostalgic reminder of a bygone era. And so, as the pages of history turn, the story of vacuum tubes remains etched in the tapestry of time, a testament to the enduring legacy of innovation and discovery. The physical effect behind vacuum tubes was first noticed by Edison before the term electron existed. Early light bulbs consisted of a single wire called a filament that glowed when electricity was sent through it. Edison noticed that one side of his glass bulb would fade after some times. This was because of the emission electrons, which causes the bulb side to fade. In 1882, when experimenting on how to improve his light bulb filaments, Edison saw that inserting an additional wire into the light bulb allowed current to be controlled through the wire by switching the light bulb on and off. The amount of positive voltage applied to the wire controlled the current flow. US patent number 307,031 for an electrical indicator was awarded to Edison in November of 1883. The discovery was known as Edison Effect, which today is known as thermionic emission because a thermionic material, one which emits electrons when heated, was used in the filaments. The heated filament caused electrons to be emitted and they were collected by the wire. Early tubes mimicked Edison's configuration, which used a glass housing, a filament to provide electrons and an anode or plate operating at a positive electrical charge to collect emitted electrons. In 1904 J. Fleming produced the first diode. Named for the number of wires, diodes, two electrodes, were used as a switch. This type of tube was also referred to as a thermionic valve in use at the time.
The diode controlled one-way flow of current and was used in amplitude-modulated receivers, but had no amplification and couldn't amplify signals detected. This directly heated type of emitter gave way to tubes with separate cathode to provide the electrons, referred to as indirectly heated. The materials of the filament or cathode determined the operating voltage needed to emit electrons. Tube technology and manufacturing evolved by increasing the number of wires or collectors which controls to supply of current. Triodes, tetrodes, pentrodes, each configuration overcoming the weaknesses, the previous tubes offered and provided improvements for signal handling and amplification. Tubes found use in signal applications, which used a relatively lower voltage, and in power applications, where the voltage were larger. A coating of barium or strontium oxide was used when the anode was operated at less than 400 volts. At higher voltages these emitters were damaged, so tungsten or thoriated tungsten was used. For power applications, these materials could withstand temperatures as high as 2400 degrees Celsius. Specialized tubes like cathode ray tubes were used in television receivers, radars, and computer systems and fire control displays. Phototubes converted light energy to electrical energy. Televisions of the 1950s and 1960s required high voltages to drive the picture tube. A black and white television has about 7,000 volts stored in the capacitance of the picture tube. Colored televisions use 33,000 volts. With these voltages, it seems strange looking back that tubes were considered replaceable by the owners. After all, the commercial devices in use had train service fleet supporting them. Yet, during these years, replacements were available at almost every type of outlet, gas stations, grocery stores, and appliances stores. Issues with tubes were easy to troubleshoot. If the device didn't work correctly, the problem tube was not glowing while the remaining tubes were glowing. You then removed the tube, walked it down to the neighborhood gas station, checked it at their tester, pick up a replacement to put back in the device. During the 1940s, when the ENIAC was under construction, the basic principles of vacuum tubes and their circuits were familiar to most electrical engineers. Tube structure contained cathode, plate, and grid. Cathode is the electrode from which the electrons originated. To cause it to give electrons, its temperature is raised with a heater. In some tubes, the heater is the cathode, but for the tubes used in the logic of the ENIC, the heater is inside a small metal can. This can is coated with a mixture of barium and strontium that efficiently emit electrons at lower temperatures than the heater itself. Plate, physically designed as a metal can surrounding the cathode with some free space between them. When the plate is at a sufficiently high voltage with respect to the cathode, then the electrons emitted from the cathode travel across the gap between them and hit the plate. When this happens, a current flows through the tube. Note that the electrons can only flow from the cathode to the plate and not the other way around. A tube containing containing just a cathode and a plate is called a diode. Grid tubes can also have one or more grids electrodes between the cathode and plate. If there is a single grid, then the tube is called a triode. If it has two grids, then it is called a tetrode, and if it has three grids, it is called a pentode. Physically, the grid is usually formed as a wire spiral around the cathode and in the space between the it and the plate. The spiral is loose enough that there is space between the wires for the electrons to pass. If the grid is supplied with a positive potential battery, the electric field will be formed from the grid towards the plate. This enables the electrons emitted by filament to cross towards the plate, making this triode forward biased. If the grid is supplied with a negative potential of the battery, the electric field will be formed from grid towards the plate. This prevents the electrons emitted by the filament to cross towards the plate. This is called reverse bias triode. With these, we can control the flow of current in the circuit. Tube characteristics in circuits. When the grid of the tube is sufficiently negative that essentially no current flows, we call the conviction cutoff. Conversely, when the grid is sufficiently positive at zero volts or even slightly positive with respect to the cathode, then there is no restriction on the flow of current due to the grid. 
This condition is called saturation. When the tubes are used for amplifiers, they are typically operated in the region between cutoff and saturation. However, for logic circuits, we want these tubes definitely on or off. So we operate them firmly in cutoff or saturation. When analyzing circuits, we take as a convection that positive current flows from higher potential to A. Lower potential. This means that convectional current flows in the opposite direction to the electrons, meaning that the convectional current in a tube flows from plate to cathode. With this we can form a NOT gate, and gate, OR gate. Tubes can be classified by number of active electrodes. Device with two active elements is a diode, usually used for rectification. Device with three elements are triodes, usually used for amplification and switching. Then triodes, pentodes, and so on. Tubes can be classified by frequency range that is audio, radio, VHF, UHF and microwaves. While tubes provided the amplifiers used in radio, radar, television and computers, they had the drawbacks of being easily damaged by vibrations and shock. They needed a lot of power for heating. And they certainly weren't that portable. By 1959, semiconductor components were proving to be dependable and efficient. They become widely available, tube-based systems were replaced by solid-state equipment. Semiconductor Transistors In our next chapters, we will explore Transistor, the king of modern technology. I hope you found this video informative and if you did, kindly subscribe this channel, like and share, see you in the next one.